For railway lovers, Talithlin is the Mecca. The plaque is there to prove that even the great ones have made the pilgrimage, and it was faith, with pick and shovel as an offertory, which restored the line right up to Abernolwyn. Its locals are not so much engines as miniatures in brass and lacquer, all gone wild and run away from some Victorian mantelpiece. The staff is part voluntary, part permanent, but all young. Young enough, that is, to run a model railway at least. And youth is outstripped only by their shyness. There, now I've upset the timetable. But the supporters are not so shy. They come to get close to it all, be part of a train, snap a train, which is easier than the staff, snap at one if you can make enough noise, or defend it to the death if you hate road travel, maybe drive a train uh, with some assistance, or even try to build one. That is if you can catch it unawares, because like the staff, some of the stock is uh, just as shy. Every arrival brings with it the air of a reverential feast. In the hush, up or down, it has been known to hear a transistor drop. Passengers sit and adore it all right up to the buffer stops. And no one leaves without a peep in the cab, a pat on the boiler, or praise for a piston or two. There's a continuous sideshow in the yard, and you get that strange feeling of being at odds, which is part and parcel of the time. For while engines refuel for the thirsty climb back to Abernolwyn with sound effects from a scrap box of the 30s, there's an outrage in diesel standing amongst the smoke and steam, looking as out of place as a tank in the tower. And where time was filled with business in slate, its business is now time filling. The devotees who restored the rail came for the work and a quiet satisfaction but it's the holiday crowds which pay its keep. They come for the ride, and when it's all over, buy badges and souvenirs, a hot dog or two, and that puts one more railway in its proper place, a curio from Bassett Luke. Your first impression of the Snowden line is all steam, smoke, and lop-ended locals with attendant demons making sure that nothing ever goes out. The station gates are unlocked once every half hour to admit a train load, exactly a train load. Maybe it's because of the lack of oxygen. And the guard, fully aware of your state of mind, grimly locks everyone in, and the banishment begins. The train skirts Snowden in a way you think, thank God, it's going to go somewhere else. But it's the engine's sneaky way of pretending disinterest before doubling back on itself to take the mountain off guard. With envy, you pass climbers free to change their minds, resolving to get off next stop until there it is above you, all set on fire by the loop line train. And you know you're in for the whole trip and nothing but. Then down comes the cloud, and the observer, up in the observation coach, leans nearer to the glass. So you climb up out of summer, into landscapes without kindness, without sound, all overexposed at the edges, into a world where phantom climbers pass ghost trains doomed to eternal penance. We return into the daylight with a growing sense of relief. 
It's only at the bottom of the climb, where winter's drained down from the peaks, that we feel a remaining twinge of anxiety for all those families still waterlogged on the upper slopes. In the shadow of Snowdon, and quite overshadowed by its mountain railway, is Gilvac the terminal station of the Lake Lamberis line. It's put on airs now, flaunting holiday colours, but its workaday origins are everywhere, like in this line of skips below the scar of the Vivian Quarry, which they help to gouge out. Or in this sad little fence, which turns out to be a dull queue of redundant slate wagons. Across the yard, a clock face of slate outwears time, which has worked out its spite on the inclined railway. Pulleys, cables and anchor chains fry away in rust and rubble. Some oddities in the yard remind you that rebirth needs equipment, and a full-scale workshop across the way offers a glimpse of shapes to come. Traffic is a two-train affair to Penthlin, with a passing loop at Kaith Ledan for a lakeside picnic on the return trip. So grab a hamper, join the train, while I get tickets. Penryn Castle, all cubes and geometry in the mist. It's become a stately home for retired locals, not all of them narrow gauge. It's a painter's palette sort of a place, a railway a la Matisse. The orphans sit out their days dressed in new finery, not a drop of oil on their hands, to be seen but not heard. It's nice to know they'll never lack care, but somehow locomotives behind glass have the eternal appearance of being stuffed, a piece of statuary, a sort of stately peep show. The 
The line running along the shores of Lake Bala is far too small to take seriously. Perhaps it's this model Western class diesel which gives it the air of playing at railways, taking the puff out of it all. Though at weekends, all for all Maid Marion puts the line back under steam, just as it was in Great Western days. As for reminders, it's as rich in these as chocolate and cream. This was the line which climbed up to Blynau Festiniog, competing with the London Northwestern for business in Slate. If the Talith Lynn is the railman's mecca, the Festiniog is the promised land. The old slate shed in the station yard reminds you that the wharves of Port Maddock grew from the line's trade with the quarries at Blino and set the pattern of narrow gauge railways overseas. There's a mixed stud of locals. Upner Castle is a diesel fugitive from the Admiralty Line near Chatham. Bountaineer was made in 1917 by the American Locomotive Company for the trenches of the First World War. It worked a French sugar beet line and is now the only surviving war department local still working in the United Kingdom. Pretty little Linda and her sister local Blanche escaped from the Penryn quarries to pull the heaviest trains 9,000 miles every season. The trains have been granted home rule with stock that's been largely rebuilt. You can sit out the journey in first-class comfort, whilst the sterner stuff goes by one of the quarrymen's coaches, lovingly called bug boxes. End-to-end -end benches, where no one wants the corner seats. Number 14 is an immigrant from the Barnstable Linton line, the only buffet car in Britain selling draft beer. No cider. The train curves sharp right out of the station across the Cobb, a sea wall built across the estuary in 1811. The first tramway rolled across here, running down from the Molwyn Hills with horses riding up behind in wagons of their own before the long haul back to Blino. But today, you relax in the buffet of Coach 14, with no sign of its humbler origins except the Southern Railway stamp on the ashtrays, or in the Victorian plushness of antimacassars and a gilt luggage rack. There's enough passing loops to see the rest of the Festiniog go by, and there's a spice of do or die each time you poke your head through a window. Narrow gauge clearances are a matter of inches, and the scenery can hit you with a cabin or a cutting. Above Tunny Bulk, only a glint of gold through the green shows where the line curves in a wide horseshoe. Tunny Bulk is all peace and white picket fences. In layout, it's an island platform between the down line to Port Maddock, the up line to Duolt. The old goods shed has been made into an attractive shop and cafe. It's a last station with any access by road, and there's a car park for those who want to pass a morning watching the trains go by, whether it's up Nor Castle, growling up from Penryn with a first train for the day, very lightly loaded, or Linda gliding down to Port Maddock, leaving most of her customers picnicking up at Duolt, and every driver knows that this is a chance for his own little uh, brew-up. Then it's off up to Duolt on the very last stretch, and something to look for. So keep your eyes left for a glimpse of the cottage where Germany calling William Joyce Haw Haw once lived. And here at Duolt Manor, another reactionary, Cromwell, made his headquarters so high in the hills, the only road to it even today is the railroad. Duolt marks the end of the line, cut off from Blino since 1954 by the man-made lake of the Electricity Board, and the company has been seeking compensation in a legal battle which must be the longest on record.
An army of workers have raised an embankment which spirals the station to a new and higher route for Blino. The land was given freely and Alastair, a little rust and diesel, pulls the construction train for volunteer workers who have already bridged the old working line on the station approach. Space for this run-around loop was carved from the hillside and the spoil used to construct the new embankment. There's no real date fixed for the first train to pull up to Blino and make up that break in the timetable since 1946. No one knows which engine will bear the load or the honours, although high on the list must be Prince, old yet active enough to achieve a centenary while still in passenger use. Over 6,000 members devote time and energy, but railways like marriage need more than love to uh, keep the grass off the tracks. But as it is, it's a railway with a purpose and a working schedule through 10 months of the year. It's reliability and courtesy, whatever the class, and a performance any standard rail would be proud to achieve. It offers you the quiet of a countryside station, or the fuss of a terminal depot. And it's all there in miniature, yet just as big. And you want to put it all in a box and bring it back home. But there, if you want to get the feel of it, you ought to do it on your own. So relax in a corner with a ticket up to Tanny Bulk and back. <laughs>